Hey guys, this might be kind of a long video, kind of scatterbrained, but I'm going to go over some different things here, some verses and commentaries, and kind of a reply to Ed Finneger, who left a comment on this video that I posted of Robert Breaker, where he was going over Romans 8.22, and we're talking about, uh, let's see, I'll just go over the Romans 8.22 again. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And so Robert Breaker and, and other lots of other people believe that the whole creation means the earth and the animals, the trees, everything is groaning in pain, uh, you know, literally or figure or you know, figuratively or literally, which is how Robert Breaker is saying it. Uh, and uh, and I said, you know, that. And I read some commentaries from Kaufman that said creation means men, specifically mankind. And uh, so, and I said, you know, the grander scope of this is that people use this to, uh, as a proof text for this millennial kingdom doctrine, that the Lord Jesus will come back to this earth physically, physically reign, for a thousand years and that uh, somehow the earth is going to be restored to how it once was before in the Garden of Eden where all the animals get along together and you know everything is uh, is happy and in its original order well Ed Finnier's comment here on Robert Breaker's video Robert Breaker is saying uh, that creation means the earth and, and everything and uh, he takes it kind of literally saying that people are hearing sounds. You can actually hear, literally, the earth groaning, uh, which is pretty bizarre. Uh, anyways, I'm going to read this reply that Ed said to me. We're going back and forth here a little bit. He said, yes, they may be making it hyper-literal, but the point is that nature itself will eventually be freed from the curse that came with sin. Okay. He says that nature itself will be eventually freed from the curse that came with sin. Okay, where is this stated in the Bible? Okay, he made a statement here. There's no verse to back this up. Now, I'm going to kind of jump ahead here a little bit, and let's look at what Peter said about this in 2 Peter chapter 3 when he says about the day of the Lord, he says, let's start in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works there that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness now ed here is saying that nature will eventually be freed from the curse that came with sin peter says that nature the earth and everything pertaining of this world will be burned up it will be dissolved and gone done away with and what I think that Peter is referring to, I think that, you know, when we die individually, uh, you know, as far as our life is concerned, all those things are gone. But the point is that even if you look at all the, the sayings of Jesus and such, you know, Jesus said that we're not to put a lot of stake into this earth, you know. Uh, we should build treasures in heaven, not treasures on earth. Why? Because... On earth, uh, moth and rust destroy. And, uh, you know, in Hebrews it says that, you know, we're, we're looking, uh, I don't know how specifically it's said, but, you know, we're looking we're looking towards a heavenly home, basically. You know, and we're, we're foreigners and strangers in this land, basically. And uh, these people that believe in the Millennial Kingdom, they're putting a lot of stake into this physical world. And they're putting a lot of stake into our physical bodies, which is an aspect of it too, which I've covered with Robert Breaker going over this, saying that, uh, you know, somehow our bodies will be physically resurrected. And 
which somebody else left a comment on that video, which is good too, and he said, uh, I thought flesh and blood couldn't enter into the kingdom of heaven, not according to Breaker. Well, there you go. That's a straight Bible verse that refutes this idea of a physical resurrection. Okay, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven or inherit the kingdom of heaven either way. So my first thing is here with Ed's comment is that he says that the nature itself will eventually be freed from the curse that came with sin. Okay, well, give me the verse, and then we can talk about that. Then he says the creature in verse 19 is not speaking of mankind, but creation. Mankind isn't subject in hope. The lost have no hope. Creation is waiting for the blessings of the millennium and coming of the church age believers who are sons of God. And so you see how his millennial kingdom beliefs is tied in with this verse. And that was the main point really of covering these verses. And so I'm going to kind of go over Romans uh, 8, 19, I believe. Uh, yeah. So kind of going back a little bit and, you know, just kind of this whole passage. I'm just kind of looking at these verses with a microscope lens and uh, examining them. I'm looking at the commentaries. Of course, there are a lot of futurists. Uh, you know, a lot of the commentaries that are provided on Study Light, a lot of them are dispensationalists or futurists. They believe in uh, the Millennial Kingdom and stuff, and so I don't agree with all of them, but there are other ones who have alternative commentaries, and uh, I'm going to share with you the ones that I think are more accurate, and I read Kaufman's commentary on verse 22, and so I'm going to look at his on verse 19. I'm going to look at a couple of others also, and uh, you know, usually a lot of the, the first person I've went to on a lot of my recent videos is Albert Barnes, and you know, I'm not going to go to his... Uh, I might read over it and I can show you maybe, you know, what he says and explain maybe why I don't agree with it, but, you know, uh, yeah, I usually, uh, he's right about a lot of stuff. I don't think he's right about this. And so verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And see, I'm going to go over this because he mentioned specifically verse 19. He says the creature in verse 19 is not speaking of mankind but creation as a whole, basically, is what he's saying. And when you look through the commentaries, there's a lot of them. They'll have lists of all the different interpretations of this. There's a lot of different disagreements on what the creature or creation means. And if we're talking about creation, everything that God created, you see, that could include angels, because God created angels. And so, you know, there's some people, well, they say, if th this creation or these creatures are looking for redemption, then, um, you know, the angels aren't redeemed, and so they can't be included. So it's like all of God's creation excluding angels, okay? So maybe, you know, I don't know what Ed believes in that. Maybe he needs to be more specific and realize what he's saying, okay? So um, I think there's just not a lot of thought that's put into this. It's just a lot of regurgitating what people have heard, and a lot of people have just fallen for the false futurist doctrines, and, uh, you know, because of Schofield and others that have made it popular over the years. But uh, maybe I'll kind of read through this passage as a whole, or at least down to verse 22, or 23. Let's see. And, you know, this video isn't going to be the end-all, be-all on this for me. You know, I'm going to continue to go over these separate verses and the passage as a whole. And, you know, I'm just going to bring some different uh, ideas and, and get a little bit deeper in this video on this. But I still need to do a lot of studying anyways. I'm kind of rushing out this video. I've been looking at these verses. You know, he left this comment a couple days ago or whatever, and I've been researching it since. And I'm like... You know, I've been busy and tired with work and stuff, but I'm just like, eventually, you know, I just need to put this out here so people can get this. What I've seen so far, it's, verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay, specifically speaking of believers. Um, you know, he says, you know, Whatever suffering, pain, misery that we go through in this life, in this world, will not be compared 
to the glory that we will have in the afterlife with the Lord. You know, when we die, we will immediately receive, you know, the, the full blessings there. Romans chapter 8 verse 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And so, you know, the controversy is, who is it, who's the creature, the earnest expectation of the creature? And so here, creation isn't used. Creation, people can say, uh, you know, as I've pointed out, the Greg Miller, Robert Breaker, others, they say it's the little earth, dirt, trees, rocks, and so forth. Now, creature can't really be used in that way, okay? Creature... We could say are animals, or we could say is, uh, you know, we could say it's angels, or we could say it's people. You know, you can't really apply a creature to dirt and trees and such. And I would like to thank that this entire passage, whatever the creature is in 19, is the same as the creation in verse 22. Okay, this is one solid thought, and it's all together. Okay, and we've seen in other verses, which I'm sure I'll go over again by the time this is over with, this is probably going to be a long video, but in verses and passages like, I'm not sure what it is, Mark 15, 16, something like that, where Jesus said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't mean to go preach the gospel to the birds and the bees or to angels, but to preach the gospel to men. To mankind, to men and women, to lost people who need to hear the gospel, to be converted. Okay, and so the word creature there is used for mankind, and I believe that the word creature here is used for mankind. So, first of all, what does it mean by creature? Secondly, what does it mean by waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God? Okay, uh, so... It looks like Ed thinks that it means, um, you know, and I should, I want to go back and look and see what uh, Breaker would say about this verse or others, you know, if they go over this verse specifically also, which would be interesting, but, and maybe I'll do that when I'm done with this video. But, Ed is saying that it means when, basically when the Millennial Kingdom comes in, and, uh, you know, Christ is reigning, ruling and reigning on the earth for a thousand years, and uh, the church is ruling with him. He, he thinks that that's the manifestation of the sons of God, uh, which is quite a stretch, which is not what the verse is saying. The Bible doesn't teach the millennial kingdom. Uh, Jesus said that the his kingdom is not of this world. Pretty plain and simple. And... Uh, but the question in this verse is that it's uh, what does it mean they're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God? There's obviously a lot of different interpretations for that as well. So this is one of those controversial verses. Um, and that says, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. And so, you know, I'm not going to go over this verse right now, but this should probably be the next thing that I should go over, this verse. Uh, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. I'm kind of confused about that verse by myself, so the next one says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And so, I mean, you have to think that the creature means mankind. I mean, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to think that it means animals or anything like that. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And once you realize that this does have to mean mankind, then we've just knocked out one of the legs for the Millennial Kingdom verse, or doctrine. And, you know, that's what I'm going at here. So let's examine... Each of the verses that they use to support this doctrine, and I want people to wake up more and more and realize that these legs don't have any standing on them. They're 
they're, you're not being told, you know, what the verses are actually saying. So anyways, let's just go to the Study Light commentary page where I've written down a few different names that I wanted to look at specifically. And the first one we read most of this. Okay. For the earnest expectation of the creation waiteth for the revealing of the sons of God. He uses some kind of other Bible translation here, but it's the same idea. So it's the common interpretation of this verse, which this writer differs, is represented by the following. The creation means the world, the whole world of nature, animate and inanimate. So he's basically stating what Ed Feniger and, and Robert Breaker and Gregory Miller and other people believe. These people are all dispensationalists, they're all futurists. Paul, after the manner of other sacred writers, describes the external world, the subhuman world, animate and, in a, in it, and inanimate. Uh, <coughs> inanimate. You see, I don't see how uh, creature, creature couldn't mean inanimate, but creature is used in the King James Bible. And he's using a verse which says creation. And so, and there's, you know, it seems like creation and creature are kind of synonymous because in verse 22 uh, in the King James Bible, it uses creation. And then in, um, you know, in the other verses, 19 and 20 or whatever, it uses creature. And that's how Robert Breaker and others, I think, try to differentiate between, you know, these words. Well, creature means this and creation means that. But no, that's one idea. And the creature and the creation, it has to be like the same thing, okay? They're just synonymous with one another in this instance. Um, but, uh, you know, so Kaufman's going to use a different translation and go to the Greek and stuff basically and say, you know, what these words in the Greek are or whatever. It, the, all that doesn't really matter. But what matters is, you know, as I said, that it's one idea and the same thing that's the creature has to be the same thing that is creation that's spoken of. You know, there's no change in thought there. It's all one solid thought. So, Paul, after the manner of other sacred writers, describes the external world, the subhuman world, animate and inanimate, as sympathizing with the righteous and participating in the glories of the Messiah's reign. <coughs> Hodge refers to such an interpretation as the common one. Yes, the common false one. And Murray said that this view is one most widely maintained by the commentators. Very extensive and learned dissertations are available to prove this viewpoint. Prove in quotations there. The best of them, perhaps, being that of Hodge, whose logic is persuasive and difficult of refutation, but Hodge himself admitted that... In the early Christian church, this opinion was prevalent and was the germ whence the extravagance of the millenarians rose. Millenarians. Millenarians. <laughs> so, uh, saying like Hodge said that basically when people took on this viewpoint that creation means, you know, everything that God created, that that's kind of where this millennial kingdom kind of doctrine kind of arose from. And it's all kind of tied together. So before proceeding to what is here considered the correct interpretation of this verse, it should be pointed out that if the above view is taken poetically or figuratively to represent the whole creation now groaning beneath the consequences of the fall and anxiously awaiting the long expected day of redemption, then there would be no violence to the truth in such a view, okay? And uh, I might not agree with that because I don't even think that you should take it figuratively as meaning all creation. I think it means mankind, and it should it should mean mankind. That's what you should stick with. And that's why I'm looking at, you know, a few different of these commentaries because I think that they each kind of hit on some good uh, points. But anyways... The word creation in this verse is exactly the word in Mark 16, 15, which in the King James Bible it says creature, it doesn't say creation, but he's basically saying that in the in the Greek, you know, it means the same. In Colossians 1, 23, 
where both places it means human beings only, and not animals and inanimate portions of the subcreation, nor does there appear to be any good reason why the same restricted meaning should not be understood here. The following is from a footnote in the Greek diaglot. Uh, it says creation used in Romans 8, 19, 20, 21, and 22, has the same significance here as in Mark 16, 15, proclaim glad tidings to the whole creation, that is all mankind, and also Colossians 1, 23, where a similar phrase occurs that the brute and inanimate creation is not here spoken of, but mankind is evident from the hope of emancipation, from the slavery of corruption, held out in the 21st verse, and the contrast introduced in the 23rd verse, um, between the and those possessing the first fruit of the Spirit. Between the creation. Uh, <clears throat> so, despite the pre preponderance, I don't know what that means, but of the commentators alleged to support the other view, I guess just saying that there's a lot of other people that support the false view, there are nevertheless many of the most distinguished expositors who hold the view advocated here. Hodge himself mentioned as holding this persuasion, Hammond, Locke, Selmer, Ammon, and others who held that the word creation as used here means the race of mankind as distinguished from quid Christians. Note the following. Creation in the language of St. Paul and of the New Testament signifies mankind especially the Gentile world, as far greater the great, as the far greater part of creation. One cannot fail to recognize that this concept of creation mostly denotes humanity for Paul, and that he nowhere else speaks of the world of nature. James McKnight summed up the position which seems to be correct as follows. According to some commentators, the words we know that every creature groaneth, denote the whole creatures of God, animate and inanimate, which, as they were cursed from the sin of the first man, may be a beautiful rhetorical figure, may as may by a beautiful rhetorical figure be represented as groaning together under that curse and earnestly wishing to be delivered from it. Nevertheless, Romans 8.21, where it is said that the creature itself shall be liberated from the bondage of corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God, in the antithesis, Romans 8.23, not only they, but ourselves also, show that the Apostle is speaking not of the brute and animate creation, but of mankind, and of their earnest desire of immortality. For these reasons, and especially because of Mark 16.15, preach the gospel to every creature, which means to every human creature, I think, the words creature and creation in this verse, and in the preceding three verses, this note was written on Romans 8.22, signify mankind in general. Uh, I think the words in this verse, in the preceding verses, signify mankind in general, right? Jews as well as Gentiles. See also Colossians 1.23, where the words signify every human creature. And so, if then, or them, I think it means them, as assumed here, this verse is a reference to the unredeemed portion of humanity, which constitutes the overwhelming majority of all men. What is the meaning to be understood by the statement here, that there is an expectation or longing and eager anticipation looking for the revelation of the sons of God? Now, this is kind of what Ed mentioned. And this is one of the reasons why I'm going over this commentary. is because Ed said that the creature in verse 19 is not speaking of mankind because the lost have no hope. Mankind isn't subjected in hope. And so an interesting thing, too, again, if, if Ed is saying that creation means, uh, you know, all of God's creation, like I said, he would have to exclude angels. And by his own words here, he would have to exclude lost people. So if you would have to be more specific and say, this, this includes all of God's creation, animals, trees, rocks, and such, but not angels and not lost people. Okay, he would have to be more specific. But I believe that it does mean mankind, including lost people, or lost people specifically. I need to think about this and go over this more myself. 
But my main point is that this does not mean rocks and trees and such forth, and this cannot be used to support the Millennial Kingdom doctrine. So he says that it can't be lost people. The creatures, speaking of in verse 19, cannot be lost people because they have no hope. So let's go back to Coffin's commentary. What does it mean that they can have an expectation or a longing or an eager anticipation looking for the revelation of the sons of God? The most likely meaning is resident in that passion desire of human race for eternal life. Hodge downgraded such universal longings after immortality as insufficient to justify Paul's words here, but it cannot be not denied that there are deep and irreprehensible longings in the human heart for something better than the poor years of agony and frustration on earth. How eagerly do the men of science seek to hurl back the frontiers of death? How persistently do they strive to extend the human lifespan? And how pitiful is the reaction of every man to the inevitable claims of the tomb? That all such agony of frustration is indeed an expectation looking to the revelation of the sons of God appears reasonable enough. The greatest tragedy being that for earth's unredeemed billions, that expectation is but a subconscious thing leading them to seek its fruition, not in the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom their most daring hopes might become reality, but in the futile and ineffectual devices which they themselves have contrived. Such is the darkness of the epic tragedy of mankind, lost in sin, without God, and without hope in the world, until they shall turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, McKnight's, McKnight's fortunate paraphrase uh, of this verse is thus, what a blessing a resurrection to immortality is may be understood by this, that the earnest desire of mankind hath ever been to obtain that glorious endless life in the body by which the sons of God shall be made known. So I think that's uh, pretty, pretty accurate. I think that sounds a lot better than what the Millennial uh, Kingdom Doctrine supporters would try to get out of this verse. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestations of the Son of God. Okay, so, <clears throat> so uh, you know, all men long for immortality, or they long for you know, a uh, life without pain, without suffering, and uh, that is what Christians, that is what sons of God, shall obtain, and. Um, so the fact that they're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, they're waiting for, you know, they're in hope of, basically, immortal life, like I've said, life without pain. And, and that immortal life, and that, uh, you know, the life without pain and suffering belongs to the sons of God. And so in that sense, uh, you know, that is, that is the life in which the sons of God are, are manifested, the sons of God. So it might be kind of confusing, but think about it, and, you know, uh, it makes sense to me. Uh, so, you know, lost men long for that, but they're not going to seek it through turning to Christ, unless they do, unless, you know, but generally, um, you know, they want the rewards and stuff, you know, that we will have. We're saying, they're saying, you know, you go back to verse 18, it says, for I reckon the sufferings of this pleasant time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so, you know, specifically Christians suffer, Christians are persecuted, okay, especially in that time. You know, even now in other countries and stuff, not so much in the United States, you know, not physically being in prison and, and tortured and stuff for our beliefs, but, um, you know, during that time and stuff they were. So the suffering and the persecutions for Christians were, uh, you know, a very real present thing. And he was giving them hope by saying, you know, uh, you know, our future glorified state is going to far surpass this. You know, this little bit of time where we're feeling pain. You know, we have an eternity with Christ without pain and sorrow. And then in verse 19, he's basically saying that all men want that. All men want that glorified state. 
But that glorified state belongs to the sons of God. It belongs to us. We are guaranteed that. That is, you know, what God has promised us. And uh, so even though they're longing for that, they, they're in hope of that, but they're not going to obtain that unless they turn to Christ. But we are guaranteed that. So, uh, <clears throat> you so, see, so you can either get that, what I just said, out of that, or you get... Uh, there's going to be a millennial kingdom, and uh, the earth's going to be recreated, and and um, the trees are looking forward to the time when Christ comes to rule for a thousand years. You see how different those two uh, interpretations are? You know, one is nonsense, you know, and the latter, and, and then the former is the truth that I see is the truth, and so I think it's very helpful, Kaufman's commentary. I really like that. Uh, and just reading over that, I've read over that before, before even making this video and reading it again. You know, it makes more sense to me. Let's look at uh, Mark Duggins. And I'm probably going to skip looking at Albert Barnes. This video is going to be way longer than it probably should be as it is. So, and of course, you know, I'm skipping through a lot of these do believe the Millennial Kingdom junk. And that's what they're going to get out of this. Um, and some of them try to come up with good arguments, but, you know, they come up short as far as I'm concerned. So, Mark Duncan. Got to find where that is. I might have already skipped it. Mark Duncan. Dun Dunnigan. It's not Mark Duncan. Mark Dun again. Commentary of the Bible. Let's see here. What does he say? Probably not going to read all of his, but there's a certain reason why I wanted to. You know, um, mm -hmm. let's see. And creation. Creature he says the main question among commentators is what the creation that Paul has in mind, various views, the new creation, the church, uh, the rest of humanity, the creation is the, the creation excluding man. Okay, now here's what some I like. So verse 3 says, the creation is the creation of man is one of the options one of the uh, choices that some commentators will go with. This is a common view held by many commentators. The usual explanation is that the earth was put under a curse, Genesis 3.17, Genesis 5.29, because of man's sin, Genesis 8.20, and will be liberated at the time when God's Son will be liberated in a glorious fashion. Our bodies and the earth have closed ties, Glory will be given to both. Physical death and suffering entered into man's existence, thorns and thistles. Some would add storms, earthquakes, and national, natural disasters became the lot of the innocent earth. Some would say, how can it be said that physical creation groans? And some point out that often in the Old Testament, God has the physical creation sympathizing with man. Psalms 98, 8. Isaiah 55, 12, Ezekiel 31, 15, Isaiah 24, 5 through 7. And you know, as far as things go figuratively and stuff, I am very loud about lots of things in the Bible being figurative. You know, I love the figures of speech and learning about all that, and I'm very much aware that, you know, I take that into consideration when I'm always looking at different verses, that, you know, it could be a figure of speech or something, you know, that, you know, it's possible, yeah, the earth could be groaning or whatever, but that's not the context of that chapter. Okay, it's just not. So, it's not that I haven't considered that. Obviously, I get slammed a lot by people for saying that I take things too figuratively or too spiritually. But, uh, the physical creation is often paid a price for man's sin, Genesis seven twenty three. And again, even with, you know, mankind or lost people groaning, you know, it's it's not like they're specifically groaning out loud either. That's still kind of figurative in a sense. 
If this view is correct, then, Paul is here saying you and the creation are looking for the same thing, the release from this physical existence. Some commentators make the mistake of thinking that these verses are teaching that the physical universe will simply be renewed or renovated. You see? Some commentators make the mistake of thinking that these verses are teaching that the physical universe will be simply renewed or renovated, which is what a lot of the Millennial Kingdom teachers would believe. Okay. Creation is waiting for the blessings of the Millennium. So I think that's basically what Ed's saying. But such is not the case. Second Peter 3, 10 through 13, I read that about the earth being burnt up and such. Revelations, Revelation 20, 11. Okay, what does that say? It says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was, there was no place found for them. The earth and heaven fled away. And so, you know, I think that Revelations of to be understood as an allegory. It's a lot of symbolic and figurative stuff in here. But I think it's kind of the same thing as I said in like Second Peter that it's that it has to deal with individuals, specifically when an individual dies and we're judged by God and basically, you know, all the things of our past life and stuff are gone. And you know, now we're before the throne of God. That's basically what that means. But these things, these verses, they do not speak of, you know, earth being renewed. Uh, and then there's Revelation 21, 1, which I think talks about a new heaven and a new earth, which basically means a new habitation, which would be, you know, where we spend eternity, which is, you know, heaven. It's a spiritual place with the Lord. Um, you know, the phrase heaven, uh, you know, heaven and earth uh, is basically... You know, where we live. It's it's our habitation is what it means. But these do not support the earth being renewed or renovated. It says they're going to be done away with. At the resurrection, the Christian will be released from his physical body and fitted with a new spiritual body. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44 in the creation will be released from its physical existence. So, uh, let's go on to Matthew Poole. It's another one that I wanted to look at. scroll through and find this one. Matthew Poole. Looks like I have to go back up. I remember, uh, what was that? one of these. Oh, come on. Oh, there you go. I can just search for the word. That'd be a lot easier. Okay. So, there's Matthew Poole's English Annotations on the Holy Bible. And basically, I thought this was interesting where he talks about the creature here. He says, in this sense, uh, by whatever that is. Is that kind of some kind of a figure of speech or something? Prosopopi. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that. As here spoken of as a rational person, it is usual with the Spirit of God in Scripture to fasten upon unreasonable creatures such expressions as are proper only to those that are reasonable. So either way, I mean, I think that it's interesting that he knows that, you know, it talks about a person waiting or to expect, um, let's see here, Romans 8, 
19. The earnest expectation of the creature. And so they would have to be rational. It has to be like a rational person, a human, to to wait and to expect. Um, of course, people, again, could say that this is figurative or whatever, but that's not the context of the passage. Um, so that was just a little bonus. And, you know, and then verse 22, or, or verse 23, it says, you know, and not only they, but ourselves also, not only they, this is speaking of people, the whole creation. So I think I've went on for probably too long, but, you know, also I was looking at Zechariah 14.9 here, um, because eventually I'm going to go over a lot of other verses of the Millennial Kingdom Doctrine. Here is a video that Denlinger did where he was talking about the kingdom. Jesus Christ will physically rule the world for a thousand years. I wrote down every verse that he used in his arguments, and I had this on the website. And this is a PDF file because I'm having to save all the studies that I've done on the website. And because um, <clears throat> I have to do some changes to the website once I get done with UPS and everything, but I pretty much saved all the pages. But I mean, I went through and I got a lot of his, and I know there's a lot of other verses that people use to support the Millennial Kingdom, but, um, you know, I'm going to look at all this stuff. I don't want there to be any room for doubt, and I want people to see, you know, the alternative uh, interpretations for these verses, and, uh, like, here's the, the files that I have of different pages that I've saved off the website so far, you know, doc, Roman Catholic doctrines and stuff, and there's just a lot of different things. You know, here's the figures of speech that I had on there. So, uh, and then I had some other ones on, let's see, probably under Futurism, the Millennial Kingdom. Yeah. Millennial Kingdom on Earth. I wonder how much I had on that one. I probably had some verses refuting it. Some of these pages I had a lot more work done than on others. But I can't believe this video's gone for almost 45 minutes. I'm going to be getting ready to go to work pretty soon for UPS. We are slammed. We had a snowstorm like Sunday night and it really put everything back. But yeah, here's even more uh, proof text. You know, let me zoom in. Proof text for the Millennial Kingdom. And I don't even have the Romans 8 in here, I don't think. There's just so many that people would use, especially from the Old Testament. But I'm definitely going to look at, you know, some of the main ones. And, uh,. So, and here's verses that refute it, you know. The kingdom is not of this world. So anyways, yeah, I'll be going back and forth on this subject a lot. But this is basically all about Romans 8.19 for now, so. That's it, guys. I'm going to end this video. Get ready. God bless.